Okay, so we're recording. Uh, welcome everyone to our third webinar. Um, I'm really excited to uh, have my friend Mike Lawrence here, formerly of Q and now of the man of um, many coats, I guess is how we would say it, um, uh, as a consultant in California. And he's here to share his uh, thoughts on participant-driven personalized professional learning with us tonight. Um, Mike, my students are awesome, and um, I've had all four of the ones that are here were in a class of mine last uh, summer on EdTech tools. They are almost at the end of their um, uh, master's degree program, and this is a staff development course where in the end they're going to be doing something collaborative, um, kind of like a guide to effective, of, uh, effective um, professional development, but they're also going to be deciding on a topic and creating some sort of professional learning thing around that topic. So some of the people are, are in, interested in um, maker spaces. Um, Mia's, you know, I, as you, we, we, we already have been chatting, is interested in, in, in things that are Apple related. Everybody's going to kind of pick their, what their passion is and develop something that they could potentially use um, in their school at some point or in their professional career at some point. So um, I just thought you would kind of, I'd turn it over to you and then at some point we can chat um, I hope um, my students will, they, they're very good about this, we'll ask some questions, so maybe they might want to be taking notes while we're chatting, and then we can dig into this further. The goal for them is to take away some nuggets from each of the speakers that we've had, and, and last week was Mike Muir from Maine. Um, I'm inviting everybody I know named Mike to do these. Yeah, um, and, uh, and I think he gave us some really practical, good advice. So far in the course, also we've covered um, we're, we're talking about adult learning, principles of adult learning, um, and we're, we're getting into models of ed tech. So SAMR is what we're really focused on, but I hopefully will introduce some more to them as well in the coming weeks. So that's a little bit of where we've been, and we're so glad to have you here. So thanks for coming, Mike, and tell us about yourself. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I was able to listen to the other Mike's presentation last week, and it was, it was fantastic. And uh, I noticed that he and I were using the same template for our slides. So I went, had to go through and like, okay, let me change as many as I can so that it's not so uh, redundant for you guys. But it, we are also similar uh, in, in that I agree with so much of what he was sharing. Uh, so I, I was able to put in a few more things because he covered it. So uh, thank you for sharing that video with me. Uh, it adjusted my, my thinking in preparation for today and talking with you and your students. So um, about me, I was a high school English teacher and uh, moved into administration, uh, specifically focused around professional development using technology to advance student achievement. And um, that got me connected up with this organization called Q, first as a speaker and a volunteer and uh, an attendee, um, did that for years. And a couple of the board members encouraged me to apply when the executive director spot opened up in 2004. Uh, and I applied, I got the position, and started it beginning uh, in 2005, January 2005, exactly 13 years ago. And I uh, had the opportunity to um, grow the organization in that position. Uh, my title actually was changed to CEO uh, 2014. Uh, the organization started with about 2,000 members when I started and grew to 12,000 when I left. And uh, we had one event a year when I started, and we grew to about 200 events uh, in the year that I left. Um, uh, the organization financially became more successful during that time frame. And I think that a lot of that is, is the timing of it. We were right there just as educational technology when it went from this niche space to this, why doesn't my kid have it at their school kind of persona. And uh, it, was this, it was largely driven, I think, by society, like suddenly, People switched from, well, I turned out just fine and I didn't have it mentality to uh, you aren't doing right by my kid if you don't hand them a device or get them connected online or make sure that they're prepared for these jobs that don't yet exist. So in, in many ways, uh, we were successful in conveying uh, this urgency for the use of technology at all levels of K-12 K and, and I was in the right place at the right time with a fantastic group of members and colleagues like Lucy. Uh, from across the globe. And so that, that's been a fantastic ride. At the end of August, I stepped away from that position and launched a consulting firm called Maverick Learning. I named it after my Twitter handle, which is Tech Maverick. Uh, and, uh, get my slides going because I've got a couple, some of these here in my slides. Um, so there we are. 
if that works. Okay, and I can still see the video. That's so nice. So I found this um, mug on the web and I thought it was exactly uh, depicting what I do. I turn coffee into education. That's, that's on a given day, that's what I do. Um, and this is what we're talking about here. Um, uh, people, when they see me, this is what I normally look like. I usually just have a goatee. So often I'm confused for this guy, which is fantastic. Um, but uh, I can't do the British accent nearly as well, so I, I can't really ever pull it off. Uh, but it also depends on what time of year, whether people are happy about me looking like him or not, because he also finds a way to offend a lot of people. Uh, here I am wearing the same shirt and ties I am right now. Uh, this is my um, official website at MikeLawrence.me. And uh, you can see some of the things that uh, Lucy mentioned about me up here. I, I'm an Apple Distinguished Educator, class of 2003. Uh, and in 2006, Google came to Q and said, hey, we want to do something in K-12. Can you help us create that? And so uh, Lucy was also in those early conversations along with Esther Wojcicki and Chris Walsh. And so uh, Google hired WestEd and Q to create the first Google Certified Teacher uh, program and the Academy. And Lucy was uh, one of the very first contributors in what we called at the time the Infinite Thinking Machine blog and uh, launched it with support of Google. And eventually Google backed out and we kept the, the program going as not just a blog, but a TV show uh, based on the web. It's still up if you want to see all the archives at infinitethinking.org. Um, I was also honored. I put a bunch of my honors up there and I achieved my certified association executive status in 2014, which is um, a fancy title for someone that knows how to run an association, a nonprofit association. So um, I put that in there as well. Uh, I'm currently serving on the boards of CETF, which is the California Edu Emerging Technology Fund, and NECTET, which is the National Coalition for Technology and Education and Training. Uh, they have a new logo, actually. I have to update this. And of course, um, the image here is of me on the TEDx um, UC Irvine stage, uh, which was a fantastic event. It was student run. And unlike most TEDx um, opportunities, I got to go and audition for it and, and actually present instead of write up a description of my talk. And I, I particularly liked that. And it was great working with these college students. It was the largest event they held. It coincided with UC Irvine's 50th anniversary as a university. And uh, it's where I got my master's in my administrative credentials. So I was an alum and that was the, the leverage I used to, to go in and speak. So that's the image pictured there. Um, so that's, that's about me. And then I threw this in just because I mentioned earlier, I was, uh, those of you that were on early, you heard that I'm in a tie today because I had a job interview. Um, and this is the visual resume I use on those interviews. I, instead of giving them the traditional resume, um, I give them this instead. And it gives them a depiction, uh, with, you know, a timeline of that swoop of my career and what I've done and some of the stats I just referenced. Um, and uh, honors and recognition. So anyway, I just thought I'd share it because I'm quite proud of this. And it's created by another Apple Distinguished Educator. Caroline McGuire designed this and drew it and won't let me pay her for that. Um, I took her out to lunch a couple times and that's all, that's all the compensation I could, she would allow. But uh, she used Procreate uh, on the iPad to draw this. In some cases, you'll notice she took a logo I gave her, like the Education 2030 logo. That's a legit logo. She redrew it, like by hand, which is amazing. And then she, uh, she took a couple other pieces and dropped it in. But in any case, I was, I was I'm particularly thrilled with this, and so I thought I'd share it by way of background. So that's the about me. Um, shall I just roll into our talk here, or were there questions? Um, no, I was going to ask you who did your sketch noting thing, and you answered that. So that's great. Carolyn, um, she's also the same one that I sing that duet with that Lucy was referencing. Yes, yeah. Carolyn's another super talented human being. Um, and her Caroline, daughters are like tutors to my kids. And, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fun. Um, and she also runs a, pro a global project called Rock Our World, too, which I'll look up and I'll put the link in there. Um, I have a slide for Rock Our World I can, I can grab just to uh, show you. So yeah, so this is a, yeah, yeah, please do. There's something else I was going to ask you. Um, oh, I guess the, that it's a more of a comment that I just put in the chat that um, I think that, uh, you know, I started out as a classroom teacher. I was a classroom teacher for eight years as an elementary and then seven as a middle school computer science teacher and then tech coaching after that. 
is that, you know, I think, um, I think today it's important to kind of think about your, your career trajectory in different ways. Like, I don't know if everybody goes into a classroom now and stays there for 30 or 40 years. I think, um, you know, it's, it's some people want to, not everybody, to kind of have a different pathway through education and there are other options. And I think this is that what your background exhibits is that there's, there's, there's different ways you can go and still be involved in education and still make a difference and an impact on kids. Yeah. So that was what I was going to say. And I'm finding that's increasingly true of other professions as well. I just had lunch today with Sangeeta Patel, who's a lawyer. She's trained to be a lawyer, but she's now currently the CEO of LeVar Burton Kids. And she works with LeVar every day and tries to do great things with, um, with their programs that they've launched, like Skyberry and other tools. And, uh, but she's, you know, a librarian by trade, or sorry, not librarian, a, a lawyer by trade. And so she has taken what she's learned and applied it to a broader socially positive impact. So I think it's, I think it's true across the board. So here's the slide I just grabbed and dropped in since we were talking about Carol Ann. Um, she's a teacher and she calls herself the lead rocker of Rock Our World. Um, and uh, this is a slide I had built to talk about the project that she runs. I think it's at rockourworld.org. Yeah, I just put it in there. So the part, each year there's a different theme to this. And then um, there's, they build a soundtrack from school to school using GarageBand, right? Is that how it works, Mike? Yep, they do it twice a year. Um, so it's more like um, Survivor, that they do two seasons in a given year. And they do have a theme for each of those seasons, as they refer to it. Um, and yeah, they use GarageBand and each classroom builds a track in GarageBand. So one might, you do the drum tag track and then they ship it off to the next classroom and it might be in a different continent, different country, and they add a vocal track and then it goes to the next classroom in a different country and they'll add, you know, a guitar and then it goes to the next one. They'll add horns. And then by the end, they now have a song and they do this simultaneously in each of the eight classrooms around the globe. So at the end, they end up having eight songs and what she discovered that it was was that it wasn't necessarily about the music or even about the software it was about the cultural exchange that these kids would get into as they were talking to each other and so each theme sort of dives into something else about their culture like well what do you have for lunch well we in singapore we have this and we in russia we eat this at lunch and then another year it was what does your money look like and 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 Another year was solar, and let's talk about the sun. And, and so she is able to weave in so much more than just, hey, let's make a song together. But that, that was the inspiration for it in 2004 when she started it. So let me dive in here. And uh, just I, I have this slide because um, back in 2004, same year, I was out at the uh, NEC conference, what, what we now call the ISTE conference, which was in New Orleans. And just outside of New Orleans is this uh, this where this photo was taken uh, and this photo was taken um, in uh, I think it's 1906 uh, and you'll notice those those smokestacks there and you'll see the guy on the cart with a horse and even even not as a scientist I think we can agree that that, that is one horsepower right I think I can I can do the math on that no problem uh, this next one you'll see the same smokestacks it's taken out on the same road just outside of New Orleans the Mashad facility and uh, this is a Saturn, uh, Saturn I rocket, uh, which I believe is 32 million horsepower. And it's just 50 years later. Uh, and the, the purpose of these two images is to show you just how swiftly uh, things can change, just how swiftly we can see technology advance. And it's a reminder that, yes, change is constant. And we as educators, uh, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we are looking at our practice and looking at our work and constantly improving and changing. Maybe not to the tune of 32 million in, in 50 years, but I would hope so. I mean, what would that look like? Uh, another uh, uh, fundamental concept for me that I, that I share with folks and I think is pertinent to professional development is this Native American slogan that uh, he who's learning from one who, uh, he who learns from one who is learning drinks from a flowing river. And I think it's uh, crucial um, concept to, to, to embrace as an educator, that we shouldn't ever think of ourselves as having learned all of it and that we are dispensing the knowledge, uh, but we are constantly learning alongside. So from this phrase came the concept of lead learners that I embraced at Q and um, that uh, made us actually refer to our trainers instead of being called trainers or presenters, we call them lead learners. Um, so I included that here as another guide for us. 
Um, so some of the things I wanted to speak about um, were participant-driven professional development and also um, personalized. And uh, I think Mike last week really dove into it well. Uh, he called it proficiency-based um, professional development, which is, I think, another way of looking at it. If it's, if it's looking at the end goal, which is how do you establish uh, that, that someone's achieved proficiency rather than seat time, looking at it as a completion of a test or some sort of um, uh, assessment. Um, and I agree with him. The, the part that I would take issue with is that it must be a test. And I don't, I'm not saying that he, he said that it had to be a test, but most of his examples were test-based. And while those can be valuable, I think we all know that standardized testing has quite a lot of uh, failings, especially when you look at the, the personalized aspect of it. So a little later in the talk, I'm going to share leading edge certification and how we built that and how our passion towards competency-based uh, proficiency was displayed uh, instead of a test in a portfolio. Uh, so in terms of participant-driven events, I put in some common examples. We'd like to welcome team. everybody to the X Can you guys hear the audience? It's your vocabulary. D to the D, C to the A, M to the P. Let's go. It's the Ed Yup, yup, come on. It's the Ed Can. We're about to brainstorm. At the Ed Can. Teachers, whoever you are. Yup, the Ed Can. This is where you get to be the star. Yup, yeah. welcome to Ed Can. We're glad you made it. When it's done, you'll be glad you participated. There's no set schedule. You get to plan it. That's because we don't take your time for granted. Here's where the teachers get to be the main event. We all share and learn it. An environment that is open. Why? Because now it's our turn as educators to create our own way to learn so you'll vote with two feet and attend sessions that are only relevant to you or interesting prepare for connecting and collaborate in hands-on activities and good conversation so we can take it back to the class and help our kids do far more than just pass we're going to solve problems of all sizes plus it's fun it's free and you get prizes it's the it's me and robert craven so that was done by vocabulary with my friend Bill Selleck doing the lyrics and it describes what an ed camp is. So um, I, I imagine that you've heard of or attended ed camps yourselves, uh, given that you had Lucy last year. I can't imagine it wouldn't have been part of the conversation. Uh, but this is an extraordinary movement that popped up out of bar camps in 2010 and uh, has since taken off as a, a truly great model in terms of participant driven events. And I think, I'll, and I'll say this, this is another thing I could have put as a fundamental slide that at the end of the day, as we're examining professional development, the best way to teach adults ends up being the best way to teach kids. It's just good pedagogy. And so it's no surprise that as we talk about personalized student learning, that we should be talking about personalized adult learning and professional learning. So um, I think participant driven is one aspect of it. And um, ed camps obviously is the example I just shared. By the way, that video was crowdsourced. It was a bunch of folks that said, hey, we're going to make a video. Who wants to take this, you know, six second segment? Who wants to take this six second segment? And uh, we each were responsible for shooting our own video and submitting it by a deadline. I was, I was late, of course, uh, but they still were able to slide my little six second piece in. And uh, then they put it all together and they had this fantastic video with the wrap uh, that was underneath it all. And they had shared us, they shared the file with us so we could lip sync to the, to the wrap. And uh, it was just a fantastic example of a collaborative effort, very much like ed camps are themselves. So I thought it was particularly appropriate for them to use that crowdsourced model for the video. Uh, another example is Coffee EDU, and uh, this this developed out of a Google certified teacher uh, who chose as her action effort um, to create a collaborative professional development that was uh, fairly lightweight, could happen anywhere as long as there was some sort of a you know coffee caffeinated beverage. Um, and uh, her name is Alice Keeler, by the way, and this was her Google certified teacher project for the year. And she uh, rolled out Coffee Q initially, uh, named because of the organization that she was heavily involved in, and I was obviously as well, and it has, has grown and emerged and expanded to be Coffee EDU. They changed it up slightly. Coffee EDU is a short um, one hour uh, meetup at a coffee shop on a single topic. Uh, and it can't, can't have any sort of prepared topics with slides. It's just a conversation over an hour, and it stops. Uh, stri strictly in an hour 
and it has one topic. Um, and uh, it, but it could be anywhere, anywhere uh, you know nearby. And uh, it grew up organically out of this need for two teachers to answer a question about uh, pivot tables. Uh, is how it all started. And I'll start on Twitter, by the way. Um, Coffee Q is a little bit more flexible. Doesn't have to stop after an hour and can have multiple topics. And so, um, oh my goodness, is that John Idelson? Did he just crash our party? I thought we had decent security measures here, Lucy. Uh, yeah, he's here. And he's probably in Ireland still because he was at my conference Ireland. with me. There he is in his yeah. hotel room. <laughs> you know, Dublin. I was just having some Jameson and I thought I'd come here with that. Dublin. Oh, that's so awesome. Thank you, John, for dropping in. My students are, are very happy to have this international gathering. Um, so just as a, um, John, tell, since we have you here, tell, and you're our, our special mystery guest, tell us um, uh, what you do and about Cal State Teach, because it's kind of interesting. It's not kind of, it is interesting. So um, I'm John Edelson, a professor emeritus at California State University of Monterey Bay, where I taught primarily in our computer science and our instructional technology program. But most recently, after failing retirement, I've been working with the Cal State Teach, which is a statewide teacher credentialing program. Uh, that's offered in California. We have students from the uh, Mexican border to the Oregon border. Um, uh, we actually have students literally all over the world because a number of students who are engaged in the Cal State Teach program uh, work at military bases and uh, are working on getting their multiple subject teaching credential. And uh, as Lucy mentioned, we were all here at a conference called Life, which deals with uh, mobile technology and teacher education. Lucy, anything else you think I should uh, bring up? No, I, well, I, th I think um, we have a couple people here who are in iPad schools. And I think the fact that you guys are an iPad, you're an, a an Apple Distinguished Program um, is important. So do, do you want to talk a yeah. little bit about the, I the iPad and, and Cal State Teach since we have you here? Yeah, we're also an Apple Distinguished Program. and. We are one-to-one -one with our students. We're an interesting program because we're a teacher credentialing program that is site-based. So rather than being in university taking classes, our students are teachers in their classrooms and our faculty come to them and all course material and content is delivered through iPad. So we have what are called multi-touch books. We use the Zoom video conferencing that you're seeing here. Uh, we do both face-to-face -face and video observations. Uh, so it, it's a, it, it's truly a teacher education program where we practice what we preach in terms of the technology. Our students do face with their faculty, but typically on their, in their classrooms. And we do have a number of face-to-face -face meetings, but we try to connect them with professional events like a, a Q conference, which I've you know, you should get as many of your students out to beautiful California and put it in queue. I have a little bit to do with. Does, doesn't one of your kids work for Zoom too, if I recall? Or am I might yeah. do things? Yeah. So you, you, California State, the, the Cal State Teach was education client number two for Zoom uh, when they were a startup company. And now uh, my son is the director of customer support. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. So how many students do we have here? Uh, we have, uh, I have seven students in this class, and I think six of them are here. Five, uh, yeah. We also had somebody Ian join earlier, and I believe Ian right. is from Australia, and he, he dropped out, though, but he's not one of my students. So, Michael, Mike, it's good to see you. Good seeing you, John. John's also an ADE. John, John was accepted as an ADE yeah. in the 20th century. That but true. <laughs> well, we're talking about participant-driven professional development, and, and uh, we'll get to personalized as well. Feel free to jump in and, and add anything I miss or get incorrect. No, but I think I think you uh, you probably just said it there. Participant driven, um, professional development is not a solo sport. Uh, so I think uh, the idea of, of 
learning from your colleagues to set up your own personal learning network is is the way professional development happens, but not often enough because the uh, the venues and the opportunities are hard considering the the pace that people have to uh, deal with in uh, classroom settings these days. Yeah. Yeah, it, and you just reminded me of another phrase, professional development shouldn't be something done to you. It should be something that we all collaboratively build. So I just put in a couple more examples here for this slide. Unconferences um, are another way of looking at ed camps. Uh, ed camps, by the way, have a, have a requirement that they always be free. So the reason why um, I, I, I also keep in mind unconferences, when we rolled in, we wanted to roll the ed camp into the Q conference, but we didn't feel that we could do that in good conscience and, and charge for our conference, which we always will do. So we called it the Q unconference is why we did that as well. Essentially, it's the same concept as an ed camp with a little less structure around it. Uh, and then hack education uh, used to be called edge blogger con and social ed con. And now I think it's changed yet again. Does Steve have a new name for hack? Education. I think it's hack education and you guys might be interested in this. It's going to be, it's at ISTE. It's a Saturday before the conference starts. It's an all day unconference. Um, I don't think he's changed the name, but I think he's going to change the format a little bit. One of the things that we're talking about, this is my partner in the global ed stuff, everybody. Um, he, he, one of the things that we're thinking about doing is a panel this year on kind of revisiting where we've been since the 12, it's been 12 years that this has started. And it's changed. And the, I think the whole ed tech conversation has changed. I think back then we were all very collaborative. We were all blogging. We were all excited. And the ed tech world has gotten a little bit more segmented. And it's also gotten a little bit more, um, not as creative, you know, creativity driven, I would say. And so I think it would be kind of fun to have a, um, um, a panel that would kind of say, where are we and where are we going? And, you know, ponder the hard questions that, um, that we're all grappling with. So I don't think there's going to be a major change, but but anyway, hack education is at ISTE. This guy, it, all these students live in the Chicago area. One lives a yeah. little bit further away, um, but many of them probably will be at ISTE um, next summer. Yeah, and I think here's a picture. I think uh, of one of your uh, gatherings, um, and the logo unplugged was there as well. That was something slightly different, but within the context of the ISTE conference proper. And then the newest of these is Playdate. Um, which I and for, but uh, they are gatherings of teachers that are much more hands-on and um, uh, inquiry-based. Uh, they're big here in California. There's a Playdate LA that happens every year, um, but they're also free to attend, but very loosely structured and about inquiry and hands-on experiences. Um, so I included those as participant-driven, and I think this is a really exciting time. And, and, you could look at this as the Uberization of professional development, the idea that you don't have to own taxis or, you know, the Airbnb where you don't have to own hotels. You can actually just, um, you know, work within a, a flexible space without having to have a structured schedule with predetermined sessions. Uh, it can be sort of pick up professional development. Um, I know I have more slides. There we go. And this is the uh, image that I, uh, these are the images I gathered from the people that created Coffee Q when it really began. Alice Keeler, Dennis Grice, Jim Roberts, John Carippo, uh, and the late Will Kimbley were all involved in that conversation. And so I wrote it up as an article in the On Q Journal, which is our was Q's is was Q's quarterly journal that was uh, mailed out to members. Uh, their last issue just um, came out, um, so we're going to see a, a, an evolution of, of how we publish um, in within that organization. Uh, moving forward. Okay, there it is. And that's Coffee Q. Um, another participant-driven um, structure uh, that, that uh, I was able to pioneer was Rockstar Teacher. And uh, it was the idea of John Carippo, a Q member who came to me and said, hey, I want to do this different type of professional development. Would Q sponsor it? Would you produce it? And so we said, sure. So we built this model that is um, uh, a little bit structured in the sense that it's a two or three day event. It has two hour structured um, workshops with a long lunch and then another set of two hour long workshops. Uh, and at the beginning of the day, there's what's called shred sessions. And they are essentially teasers for each of those choices that you might have for those two workshops to go to during the day. And you see shred sessions on day one and shred sessions on day two, each of those essentially advertising 
the workshops you have to choose from for the morning uh, two-hour session and the afternoon two-hour session. Uh, there are also requirements within those workshops that the presenter or the faculty member only speaks for about 20 minutes total within that two hours. Um, they shouldn't be standing and lecturing at you. You should be building something together and they are coming alongside. Again, the idea is modeling what great learning should be. Um, so it should be hands-on, it should be a student creating something, and the coach, the teacher should be in that coach mode uh, rather than the uh, sage on the stage. And so we model that with the faculty and with the attendees um, actually building something. And so that's still thriving. Uh, Rockstar camps have grown. There's now various uh, iterations of them where you can have one for TOSAs, one for administrators, and one for uh, STEM. There's some for history teachers, some for math. And so it's uh, really exploded into a very successful model to the point where we had inquiries coming from schools and districts and universities saying, hey, can we do a closed Rockstar camp where it's just for our um, uh, you know, campus or our, our institution. And so we do something called, uh, Q does something called Black Label Rockstar Camps. So I wanted to share that with you all as well. So can you tell, a little, tell us a little bit more of the format of um, Rockstar Camps? It's, it's about, you produce something, that's a big part of it, and it's not, um, anyway, can you go into the details a little bit more about, it? it's not like talking at people. Right, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely hands-on. The phrase we use is make it, take it. Um, so you might go in to a 3D uh, makerspace two-hour workshop. The presenter gets up and talks for 10 minutes about how they've done this and what they use and what products they like and which printers they use and what kind of um, uh, you know, websites they use to get their, their ideas and lesson plans. And then they say, have at it. Go, I've got a bunch of these printers and we're gonna work together and do this. And then they might, pull them together for a five minute redirect. And then at the end, they might do a five or 10 minutes sort of uh, reflection and see what they've built, see what they've done. Um, but absolutely, it's, it's uh, the idea is you're building something, not necessarily physical. Um, another one is how to incorporate poetry into your, um, your classes. I, I went to that one and it was fabulous. And the idea that it doesn't have to be an English class for us to explore poetic forms. Um, and, and, and we actually wrote poetry in that workshop. And Liz Calhoun, who was the, then was her name, she's now since gotten married. Uh, I officiated, actually. Uh, she's now Elizabeth Blum Brumbaugh. And uh, in any case, she uh, actually had us write poetry in that uh, thing. And so I walk, walked out with two or three poems of my own creation uh, created on the spot. Um, another one was uh, Twitter. What's the deal with Twitter? And you go in, essentially as a newbie, you learn what Twitter is all about, you create an account, and then you've got 100 people attending this, this event that we then encourage to follow you, so you at least come out of the gate with 100 followers. Um, so you've essentially made an account and you've learned what Twitter is about and how to use it. So we found um, at Q that this approach was particularly attractive to those that didn't self-identify as techie. You notice it doesn't say Rockstar Teacher Tech Camp. It doesn't say Technology Star Teacher Tech, uh, tech uh, Camp. Uh, it was a rock star teacher camp, and who wouldn't want to be perceived as a rock star teacher, right? All of us. And so it became sort of this gateway for folks who wouldn't have ever gone to the Q conference or wouldn't have ever gone to a Google Teacher Academy or, who, or applied to be an Apple Distinguished Educator because they're like, oh, I'm not that techie. That's so-and-so down the hall or that, per that teacher at the other campus. But rock star teacher had enough of a broad appeal that it became our gateway to get folks. Infinite Thinking Machine was similar in the sense that we avoided using the word technology if we could at all avoid it and hook folks in just with this concept of this infinite thinking machine, which was, spoiler alert, is the human brain. That was what we named the, uh, the, the blog and the podcast after was that the human brain, especially children's brains, are tr truly infinite thinking machines. Uh, we actually had an angry email that someone was saying, how dare you call computer is the infinite thinking machine. You know, the human brain, uh, she was like going on and on about how she thought we were talking about technology as the infinite thinking machine. And we were saying, no, no, it's our brains. So more info is at q.org slash rockstar. And uh, Lucy's right. It's a, it's a pretty revolutionary model. And uh, I was thrilled to be able to help it along uh, in my tenure at Q. Um, so there's some new models um, that we haven't yet talked about, and you guys are experiencing one right now in terms of online learning. This is synchronous uh, online learning. 
Um, but Twitter chats uh, broke out a couple of years ago with the emergence of using a hashtag as an organizing uh, structure around Twitter. Um, and I imagine Lucy's shared uh, the concept of Twitter chats with you, but if you haven't experienced it, and I encourage you to find something you're interested in and look it up and see when people that are interested in that are gathering. Uh, it can be somewhat tricky to figure out what the right hashtag is. Uh, a few months ago, I was trying to find where all the computer science teachers were gathering on Twitter chats, and it took me a while to figure out that it was CS chat. Uh, or CSK8 chat, or CSK12 chat, or CS for all chat. Like there's a lot of different chats in it. I didn't necessarily know exactly to look for those hashtags. So I asked around until I got the right uh, one. But they, um, they pick a time, usually an hour, uh, at some point during the week that they repeat, either weekly or fortnightly or monthly. Um, and um, they uh, will engage in a series of usually four to six questions in an hour, and they will pose them as Q1, Q2, Q3, and those that are participating in the Twitter chat respond with A1, A2, and A3 uh, accordingly. And uh, they archive those and then republish those later so they can be searchable and referenced, or if you, you know, had to be out you know, putting kids to sleep like I always are, I always am on Sundays at eight when California Ed Chat happens, um, I can look at it later and catch up. Uh, they go very fast, so there's software tools out there, like um, uh, tweet, uh, tweet Chat, I think, is the one that, that's, uh, that I most recently used. And um, there's other tools out there. Even uh, Twitter itself has an app that you can use that helps you manage Twitter, uh, a Twitter chat a lot better than just trying to do it in real time on your phone, let's say. Um, so if you haven't explored those, there is a list of Twitter chats, uh, educational Twitter chats that you can you can Google, and, and once I finish these slides, I'll paste in the URL for it. Uh, we talked about unconference events. Um, we got John Idelson on the call here. We could just talk about MOOCs with him, um, which is Massively Online Open Courses. Um, they had their heyday, I think, a few years ago, and now is the jury still out on whether or not MOOCs are an effective instructional model? Well, I think there'll always be a discussion of whether they are or not, but I think what MOOCs are probably not going to go away. Um, uh, there are uh, MIT, which is doing some, a number of the uh, universities will even let you arrange to get credit for them, but it's still sort of an idea of providing open educational resources and uh, probably not as active in the, in the US, but particularly in Africa and around the world and, and uh, places where uh, students are somewhat disenfranchised from being able to get to educational settings uh, in their country. MOOCs have been a very powerful tool. Um, uh, particularly, uh, uh, Kurt Bork has a number of uh, MOOCs which would be of interest to the K-12 community. Um, I, I think you're going to uh, uh, start seeing MOOCs sort of morphing into what would be sort of the next generation of course content material. So a lot of materials have been created in MOOCs eventually from that way and other uh, because of many of them are built around open educational resources. There was a woman at the conference, I think from London, um, John, that uh, had a, what she considered a MOOC and it was a Google Plus group. So I, I wonder if people are our, lab our kind of labeling professional learning communities is the same thing as a MOOC. I don't know if it's a definition or not. Well, well it happens. You find I, something I takes off and then yeah. someone co opts the term. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, in the uh, participation, some of the most successful students in MOOCs created their own study groups. Uh, uh, my colleagues who uh, provided a MOOC, and he was somewhat amazed when he was traveling around the world on vacation, and he sort of let his students over where he was going sort of had uh, a floating office hours at coffee shops all across Europe. Wow. 
Uh, I listed three others here that will hit um, online and blended, which we already talked about. Impact based, I want to share with you one example out of Laguna Beach and then video and audio podcasts. We talked a little bit, but podcasts have sort of boomed recently. Um, here's the, I, I, the thing I talked about in terms of Twitter chats. I had a whole slide deck, a slide for this. Um, podcasts like surprised me because uh, what was it, 2005 when I became an ADE and Everybody was podcasting from Apple at Neck, which is now ISTE. Yeah. And, and then it got kind of quiet, and then all of a sudden it's like the big thing. Now. I, I don't know. I wonder what it is that's brought it back. Maybe it's because we have more audio capabilities in our cars. Like, I, I have really old cars at home, so I'm driving a right. car right now that has we use CarPlay. And so I can listen to podcasts, which is awesome. So yeah. I, I, wonder, I wonder why it's coming back all of a sudden. I think access is part of it, what you just hinted at. But I read an article Bill Selleck wrote um, for that last on Q Journal, and he said, we, we were all excited about podcasts when it came out in 2005, 2006, and then we forgot about it. And then Serial came out, and we lost our minds. So you remember that podcast that was about, that followed that one trial? Um, <laughs> everyone sort of lost their minds over it and started talking about it, and it became like, you know, the, the latest uh, TV show to binge watch, people realized, oh, you can do that just with audio and it's called podcast and it's built into my car or my phone. Oh, okay, great. My wife's a huge podcast fan, but we our, our interest in podcasts varied by about a decade. Um, she's picked them up, you know, seven or eight years after I dropped them. Um, so here's the it's, schedule. Let's go ahead. It's interesting because, yeah, there is – you know, the podcast was sort of a freak accident. It wasn't intended. In fact, they, you know, Apple didn't really know what they created the, before the one about the at ELI at Educause was the first one. I think what really helped pick it up was the whole uh, wire cutting when people realized that they could do time shift and wire cut. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sort of, uh, oh, and I could do that with my radio shows, too. You know, you know yeah. why, why did Because uh, I know it took me a long time. I, I had habits of certain radio programs being Prairie Companion made Rest in Peace and uh, other other shows that I was, my ritual was to be there at six or to see it at a certain time. And now I've told you that I don't really care when the shows are. I've got my... Uh, podcast list and uh, i've got eight hours on the plane tomorrow and that's what i'm gonna be listening to that's a good point they're cutting the cord uh so i mentioned the calendar of educational twitter chats this is a screenshot from a few years ago uh, but i'll get the link and, and post it it's a google calendar that's maintained that tracks all of the uh, popular educational chats but a lot of them are still active in these time slots and this is pacific time zone these examples, um, but um, in any case, uh, I'll post the link. Um, online and Blended, we talked about, this is a, um, a Google Hangout that pres then President Barack Obama participated in, um, and it was obviously synchronous. And then there's asynchronous, which we talked about a little with MOOCs and um, there's other online tools, and then hybrid, which is you have some, that, some moments that are synchronous and some moments that are asynchronous planned into a course. So. I imagine Lucy has both elements in, in her course. Uh, the example I, sh I wanted to share about portfolio-driven certification is something uh, I created with a group of about 34 other organizations called Leading Edge Certification. And this grew out of a need, as we saw it, for a uh, non-platform specific and non-vendor specific certification to be able to demonstrate that you're an educator that knows how to use technology uh, to advance student teaching and learning. And so uh, we built Leading Edge Certification, came up with this, this brand that wasn't specific to Apple or Google or Microsoft or any of those tools out there, but would instead focus on pedagogy on how any of those tools could be used uh, to advance uh, teaching and learning. And so we set about a fairly ambitious uh, uh, schedule here that you could see on the screen. Uh, where we sliced up four different topics and rolled them out each in a year at that year's ISTE conference in June or July. And uh, the first, because it had the highest demand, was the online and blended teacher. So a lot of teachers were fantastic in face environments, 
but when you put them into an online uh, environment, it's there's different uh, needs as an online teacher or a blended teacher. And you could be extraordinary face to face and not so good online or vice versa, I imagine. So this was a way to teach the skills to teachers on how to translate great face to face teaching online and blended. Uh, we rolled that out in 2011. And uh, then we went after administrators and then what we call digital educator, which is essentially the classroom teacher. But we didn't want to limit it to a, certi a certificated person. It could be uh, someone who runs a lab, if, if you still have a lab, or someone who's a coach on campus to become a digital educator certified. And then our final one was really targeted towards adult learning. And anyone that works in education to run professional learning could go through and get professional learning leader certification through LEC. Uh, and this program still is thriving. I think we have about 4,000 certified across the country, most of them in California. We have about uh, 12 active um, professional learning providers for the program, and it's all up at leadingedgecertification.org. Uh, uh, you pay a fee to register, and um, the course is about 8 to 12 weeks long, and it's adaptive release online learning um, with some moments of synchronous um, learning as well within that, but it also depends on the provider how they actually deliver it. Some of them do a face-to-face -face kickoff and then they go online and then that's maybe they might even have a, a, a closure, some sort of a capstone event at the end when it's face-to-face. -face. Um, so it's all at, as I said, leadingedgecertification.org. And then the other example I wanted to give you that's impact-based is Rocket Ready uh, Professional Learning. This is out of Laguna Beach Unified and I'm working with them to take this concept and spin it out as its own nonprofit. And the concept behind it is to gamify professional learning what, and, and actually put uh, consequential rewards. So if you achieve a certain level, they give you funding to spend in your classroom on resources, materials. Um, and so the question that Michael Morrison, who came up with this idea, asked is what if we paid teachers to solve real world problems with their students? So you got right in that statement, you have like three really revolutionary concepts. One is that they are paying teachers for achievements. Number two is to make real world impact. They actually pick a problem in their community or across the globe and they try to solve it. And the third revolutionary concept is they use their students in that effort. And so the teachers are learning how to use technology through this process but the end goal isn't them just learning it. It is to improve this, uh, you know, something in society or solve a problem in society. And surprise bonus, the kids are involved as well. Kids are now empowered. They have real world experiences they can point to. When I was in fifth grade, we figured out how to, you know, clean up the world's oceans. Um, when I was in sixth grade, we worked with our teacher and we, you know, helped fund a school to get textbooks in Africa. Um, and those are both real examples of what they've done with um, Rocket Ready. So here's an example of the bonus structure and what it looks like. Uh, these are Michael's slides, by the way. And this is a teaser of a session I'm going to give at ISTE this year about Rocket Ready with Michael. We're going to co-present it. Um, and then it just I think I threw in two more slides here. They also use Michael credentials as the achievement measuring tool. So um, like leading edge certification, they build a portfolio and then that portfolio can earn them these additional uh, micro credentials, which also carry with them uh, bonuses. Now it should be pointed out that the Laguna Beach is a particularly wealthy community. It's no surprise if you've ever heard of Laguna Beach. So this model may not be replicatable across the globe, but it's adaptable. And part of the nonprofit's goal will be to adjust to different socioeconomics and be uh, impactful in each of those socioeconomic structures. Um, and so then this is the, um, the gamification side of it and how they can unlock different levels um, by getting involved in a field trip or inviting guest speakers in. Um, so those so, pieces. Michael, will you be going to uh, the mobile learning conference this year? I'm applying to present and I, I may go. I'm on that expert group. So if they fly us out there, I will not say no to a trip to Paris. So that it sounds like this would be interesting for them to have this year. Oh, okay. All right. That's not an idea. Uh, Roland and I were thinking about co-presenting on Leading Edge, but I should also do something for Rocket Ready. Thank you for adding to my to-do list, my, uh, John. Are you going? Yeah, I'm trying to get to Paris, too. So if you come up with an idea, let me know. Okay. 
Uh, Mobile Learning Week, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is uh, a UNESCO-led effort. Uh, so it's the UN's Education and Humanities arm. Uh, I was able to go for the first time last year. Uh, I had been accepted the year before, but I just couldn't go because it was too close to the Q conference. Um, so I sent Robert Craven, who was then Q's board president. Um, but it's focused on mobile learning, as you might imagine, based on the name. It's held in Paris at the UN's uh, headquarters there, which unfortunately has a fantastic view of the Eiffel Tower. Um, but uh, and it's an amazing gathering of educators from across the globe trying to handle the issues that we're facing uh, as a society uh, and how to address mobile learning in environments that sometimes don't have power or electricity or um, water, clean water, reliable water. I was my nine-year-old, by the way, sneaking in trying to uh, steal my iPad without <laughs> any of you noticing. You know what? That's just like the guy that was presenting, you know, to she stand, she made and like his kid rolls in on the, on the, in the, in the walker. Did you see that, that video of that guy? Yep. That was hilarious. <laughs> it reminded me That's of that. <laughs> video and the mother crawled. Up yes. The yes. Yeah. It was the funniest I've ever seen. Yeah, exactly. You, a good, good invitation. Yeah, that was hilarious. Uh, so this uh, is a picture of Ramsey Musalem, who is the um, uh, the host of the Infinite Thinking Machine from the second season to the fifth season, and uh, InfiniteThinking.org, and the uh, Twitter handle was ITM Show. And so all those videos are still up at InfiniteThinking.org. This is what I was mentioning earlier, that Google initially sponsored, and then Q took over um, uh, about five years later. Um, so it's another mode of professional development, and I think it links into our podcast discussion because you can have video podcasts or you can have audio podcasts. Opportunities. And I put one of the videos in. I don't think we have time to watch it. Intro. This one is an issue called hack. Flip classroom, flip teaching, flip class, flip flop. So. Ramsey's passionate about flip teaching, and so you can check that out if you want to go to it yourself. Um, I dropped this one in here because um, it relates to Rocket Ready because it's it's passion driven and it relates to a lot of the work that I do. And I think if we find, if we develop personalized and participant driven professional learning, you will find that people are able to follow their passions. And when students do that, we see tremendous outcomes. And I think when educators do that, I think we're going to see even more powerful outcomes. Um, and that's everything I put together for you. This is the, you can see this is the same slide deck style as Mike Neers from last week. Uh, so I, I had it as the first of the last slide for you. Uh, I'm at Tech Maverick on Twitter. And uh, this is an image that I pulled together from, uh, from NASA's um, plans to go to Mars. And it's a rendering, artist's rendering, although it looks super realistic, uh, of what, what the rocket that we're thinking about using to get to Mars would look like. It could also be a rocket that would help lift heavy payloads to get us to the moon. So I thought it was, again, tied to that uh, Atlas um, Saturn, Saturn one rocket that we looked at, at the beginning and uh, the overall theme of uh, rocket ready and passion learning. So I dropped it in there as well. And you can check me out at mavlearn.com if you'd like. And uh, uh, appreciate your time and attention. I'm happy to answer questions and, and see what yeah. else we can together. Yeah, Mike, I would love for you to answer some questions from students so they can grab the mic and ask if they want to. Um, anybody have anything specific for Mike? Go for it if, you, if you'd like to ask a question. Um, Mike, I'm curious, because you mentioned ed camps as separate than like play dates in terms of their, uh, their structure and what's done. And so I was thinking about it the entire session because I went to a play date way, way back in my early, when I was first starting to teach and I'm like, they seem similar to me. So what's the difference? <laughs> Thank yeah. You. yeah. Well, it's, it's largely uh, structural. Um, ed camps are organized as now as a nonprofit run by the ed camp foundations. They're still individually run, um, but they do have um, some guiding principles that they don't much allow you to change. You can't charge and call it an ed camp. Um, you can have sponsors, um, but, uh, but you have to be careful about their involvement. So play dates um, are, are, uh, that aren't under the same structure, um, and they aren't limited to those same rules. Um, if you want to go check it out, um, I just did a quick Google search and came up with play date Chicago, it looks like. Um, but that's 2013. 
Um, there, there isn't an overarching uh, organization that I'm aware of is the main well, difference that I'm so the play date, I went to the one in Chicago. So Jenny McGarrah was the person that pioneered that. And it was fun. It was, um, I, I just remember it being more kind of playing with specific things and sharing as opposed yeah, to based hands on. Um, but it was, it was exciting. And I don't know, I haven't seen a lot of them lately. Um, the other thing I was going to say about the Ed Kevin foundation is that they're, you know, it started as a very informal thing and now it's a really an organization like you mentioned and they've gotten Gates funding. Um, they've gotten some, you know, some, which is good because I think the ed reform world has kind of largely ignored this kind of professional development. They don't, I think people see teachers as needing to be fixed as opposed to being empowered. And that drives me bananas because I think it's the other way around. Yeah. Um, there's a, a minority that need to be fixed it's people that need to be inspired. So um, I was just talking to a professor uh, from that conference about ed camps, and we were talking about a certain ed tech person that we know who's very anti ed camp because they got Gates funding. Um, I think that's, you know, I still think it's a really good thing for teaching. Mm -hmm. Any kind of informal, uh, teacher driven, teacher led kind of thing is, um, is worth its money. Um, you know, I think it's a combination of both. I think teachers also need some formal stuff. Like for instance, when you're a science teacher and you're talking about how to get kids over um, the misconceptions around science and things like that, maybe there's some specific things that you need to be able to do in your classroom to teach that way, that a professional needs to deliver to you. But all in all, um, I'd rather have people, if we want our kids to be lifelong learners, then we need to model that for them. And that's what all of this stuff does. I couldn't agree a bit more. Anybody else? Is, has anybody been to any of these things or is anything particularly inspiring to you perhaps um, as something that you might want to pursue in your final project? I have a question more on curiosity and I might have missed it, but um, in the conference where the teachers might not have been tech savvy, I think it was the Rockstar Teacher Conference. Um, do you think that those teachers who aren't, weren't like the tech savvy got, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like sort of got shut down a little bit when they figured out how much tech was involved in the conference? Or do you think they walked away saying, oh, I'm going to try some of it now that I know how to use it? Well, I have a particularly positive view. And so I, th I think, I think I land on the, the, the latter that they, uh, that they came away inspired and, and willing to try a few. Um, in the, roughly 10 years that, that we've been doing it. It started in 09. Uh, um, we haven't had too many complaints. I, I think, you know, I think maybe two times did I have someone email or come up to me at, at Rockstar Camp and say, this isn't what I thought it was. I just, I'm not ready for this and I need to leave. I think only twice did that happen. Uh, I think teachers, as Lucy shared, uh, we want to be empowered and we want to have the opportunity to, to, to structure our own learning. And the beauty of Rockstar Camps, much like Ed Camps, is that if you don't like a session, you vote with your feet and you go to another one. And there's no harm, no foul. If you go to a session at a Rockstar Camp that's just way over your head in terms of technology, just get up and leave and go to a different one and um, see if that suits suits your your skill level and your, your interest. Uh, but I think you, you look the word curiosity and I think that's that's absolutely present and and uh, you know vital in, in any of these types of professional developments sorry John go ahead I think the, the strength of your right arts to the camps is the reason I think people uh, you know really have thought they were great is that you have that format where you sort of explain what's going to happen you make it quick you also limit the amount of time that the presenters are presenting so it's the structure of it works uh, and I think the word of mouth very few people go to that and don't know what they're getting into yeah it's not people have gone through it and uh, to me I think it's one of the finest models of professional development in that um, it grew out of a great enthusiasm and a model and they kept track of what worked I, you know you the feedback that people gave was listened to by the peers. And uh, things don't last as they have last if they aren't meeting the needs of the majority of the people who attend. Yeah. My I daughter, see a question here, Lucy. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I think one of the things that um, my students may run into if they decide to, to, some of them are kind of in instructional tech roles right now. Some of them are contemplating as a future career move. Um, I'm wondering what, what's your advice for designing professional development that um, meets the needs of all learners, particularly the ones who are a little bit reluctant? Yeah. So there's two approaches that I've found to be successful in that space. One is you, you have them follow their passions and it's that inquiry based learning. So the story I tell is when we were implementing the digital high school program in California in the late nineties, we put a computer in every teacher's classroom, whether they wanted it or not. And I had a health teacher who said, look, Mike, don't waste it. Don't put it in my room. I'm not going to use it. Um, and I said, well, I have to, it's a condition of the grant. And so let's figure out something that you can use it for. And I started with something I knew, I knew, didn't know a lot about this guy. I knew one thing, uh, two things. He used to be a football player, NFL. And the other thing I knew is that he was an avid bird watcher. And so I fired up the search engine and I typed in bird watching and we came up with, and he was sitting right next to me. And we came up with five or six uh, websites. Um, that were about bird watching, and he said, "Oh, I subscribe to that magazine about bird watching, or oh, I know that author, or oh yeah, here's here's a great uh, you know type of bird that he likes to watch." And soon enough, he pushed me off the mouse and started clicking himself because he was passionate about it. Had nothing to do with his chosen subject of health, but I I started to hook him in based on his passion, what he cared about, and so I came back and visited. Then I showed him uh, Minesweeper right, which is a game on Windows, because he didn't have any mousing skills. And so I showed him Minesweeper, and I used its own addictiveness to get the guy good at mousing. And so I just slowly walked this guy along. Again, Minesweeper has nothing to do with, with education and with health, but it gave him the skills he needed. And bird watching has nothing to do with this topic, but it got him interested in the World Wide Web and searching. And, oh, hey, there might be something that might help me with this lesson on pancreas, the pancreas, which I to talk about tomorrow with the kids and so you know bit by bit this guy came around the corner because I was able to hook him in using things that he was interested in and then the other thing that I would say that I found to be valuable is make sure that teachers know we don't have to know everything about the technology we're using um, I had my favorite teachers that I worked with of all time would say I don't know what a document camera is let's open it up and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out with the kids and they didn't have to be the expert of that they were just the expert of their curricular area or their, their, their concept that they were trying to teach. And once you show them the tool and the kids largely led the effort of, oh, you plug this in here and then you aim the camera here and then it shows up over here. And then the teacher brain goes, oh, I can use that to show physical uh, examples of history. This is a history, um, you know, uh, evidence of something. And we can talk about it as a class or I could put something over the doc, you know, under the document camera and have the kids describe it. So just making sure teachers know that you're expecting them to be the curricular pedagogical expert. You're not expecting them to suddenly be this tech expert. Let them be open to the idea that they can turn to the kids and ask them to help. And then it becomes experiential learning and they, uh, that students get this wonderful model of a teacher, an adult who's willing to learn with them. And it goes all the way back to that um, Native American quote that I gave you at the beginning. That reminds me of um, uh, an I3 project that I worked and advised on very peripherally um, from Columbia College and um, Chicago Public Schools where <clears throat> it was called the Convergence Academies. And they had these digital maker spaces that kids could hang out in after school or a teacher could bring them in to do projects. They had 3D printers, they had cameras, they had the whole everything. Um, and then in the schools, they paired uh, a digital media artist, somebody from Columbia College is kind of an artsy school here in Chicago. So somebody that had some filmmaking or photography skills or whatever with a teacher to design these convergence units that were curricular units based on what they needed to teach on their standards. And it was infused, they had to, they had to in, incorporate something from these six pillars that they identified, which I'm blanking on what they were, and the four C's. Um, and I thought it was a really well-designed thing, and uh, it, it kind of took some of the pressure off of the teacher to do the tech piece, and they were treated as if the, they were the curricular expert. And I thought it was a great model. This went for three years, and then the funding ran out.
unfortunately. But I, I really thought the structure was great because it was supportive. Yeah. We did a program at my high school where I taught uh, called the Street, and Street stood for Students to Teachers Reaching Educational Excellence Together. It was a similar model where the kids would come in, teachers would pair up uh, in cross-curricular pairs, and they would build a unit with the students as the technology experts and the teachers as the curriculum experts. So on that note, guys, I uh, would love to continue to talk with you, but I have to get on a plane in three hours. So all right. Sleep a little. Thanks, Good, guys. Ben. Take a nap, John. I, and, and we all, all of, uh, I think all of us need to get on with our lives today, too, because there's a lot going so, on. Well, thank you so much, hours. And Mike, uh, hopefully I'll see you at the, uh, the uh, league, league, uh, conference in Monterey. Are you going to it? No, I don't believe so, but we'll find yeah, a time to get together. Your room's waiting if you need it. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, John. Safe travels. All right, everyone. Um, if you have any other further questions, you have Mike's contact information, so you can um, you can you can uh, get uh, in touch with him. <clears throat> and please follow him on Twitter and uh, you know, I highly recommend reviewing this webinar because there's a lot of info in it and the one before when you get to the when we get to our final benchmark projects because it may refresh your memory about some aspects that you'd like to uh, include in your final projects. Mike, I'm going to um, <clears throat> stop the recording and post this shortly on YouTube and on Facebook and I will also include the chat because I was kind of Google jockeying um, all the things that you were talking about in the chat. So there's tons and tons of stuff. Uh, for people to refer back to. So I love this conversation and I, I think um, this is really useful and I hope others will benefit from it. Uh, thanks to everyone who stuck around despite my um, lack of planning or not lack of scheduling accurately skills and uh, I will see you guys online next week. Um, thanks a lot for coming Mike, I appreciate it. Thank you, it's great chatting.